The term ephemeral comes from the Greek word ephemeros, which means lasting a day. In science, the term ephemeral is used to refer to organisms that are only around for a short period of time. For instance, spring ephemerals are herbaceous wildflowers that emerge early in the spring in woodlands, meadows, and along stream banks. They complete their reproductive cycles in just a few short weeks, leaving very little evidence that they were even there to begin with. These spring ephemerals benefit from popping up early because they're able to avoid competition with trees for sunlight. And the more sunlight a plant is able to obtain, the more energy it's able to put towards reproduction. Additionally, these spring ephemerals have a pretty unique way that their seeds are dispersed. It's through a process called myrmecocari. Myrmecocari is the dispersal of seeds by ants. And how that happens is when the plant is creating its seeds, it also makes a little fatty bit on each of the seeds called an eliosome, and that is what the ants are interested in. So the ants will actually be hauling the eliosome back to their nest because they're like, oh wow, what a little tasty treat. And sometimes along the way, they drop the seed because they're like, this is dead weight to us. So they drop the seed and that therefore disperses the seed. And it's a wonderful little process because the ants get a little tasty snack and the plant gets its seeds dispersed. With all this being said, spring ephemerals vary widely in appearance. So we're gonna try to identify as many as we can. And we're gonna look at some that are commonly found in Central and Eastern North America. So let's go ahead and try to identify some spring ephemeral species. This is a white trout lily, and white trout lilies have ovular to egg-shaped opposite leaves that are molted with brown splotches. Some people remember the leaves because they are shaped kind of like a trout's mouth. I don't really see it that much, but some people remember that way. Hence the name white trout lily. But the stem is about as long as the leaves and supports one drooping white flower with six tepals that occasionally curve back and six yellow stamen as well as a single pistil. Now, tepals are what we call these petal-like structures when the line between petals and sepals gets a little blurry. Similarly, the yellow trout lily is very visually similar to our white trout lily, except for the fact that this species has a yellow flower. Typically, these yellow trout lilies will bloom a few weeks before the white trout lilies, but there still may be some overlap with both species blooming in early to mid-spring. This is a large flowered bellwort. This species belongs to the genus Uvularia, and it's easy to remember because the yellow flowers kind of resemble a uvula dangling down. At least that's how I remember it. Each flower has six petals, six stamen with orange anthers, and a single pistil. This plant can also be identified by its leaves, which are smooth, ovular, alternate, and they are typically twisted. So that's a really easy way to find it when you're out in the forest. This species blooms mid to late spring. This is a prairie trillium. As their name suggests, they are found in prairies and woodlands. It can be identified by its three large dark green world leaves that sort of have a molted pattern similar to the trout lilies I showed you earlier. However, this species has maroon or reddish brown flowers, which have three petals and three green sepals, six stamen with three yellow anthers and a single pistil. Trilliums bloom in early spring and were once used by the indigenous people to treat menstrual cramps and help with childbirth pains. Now, please don't pick trilliums from the wild though. A trillium can take up to 10 years to produce a flower. And if you want to use trilliums for medicinal purposes, I would grow your own. And that statement really goes for all of the plant species in this video. This is spring beauty. Spring beauties are delicate pink or white flowers with dark pink veins. They have narrow grass-like opposite leaves and flowers that are made up of five petals, five or white pink stamen, and a single pistil. This species is commonly used as an ornamental due to how pretty it is, and I have to say that it is definitely one of my favorite spring ephemerals. These are Virginia bluebells. They are a really pretty spring ephemeral with blue trumpet-shaped flowers. And even though the flowers typically come in blue, they can also be pure white or pink or even a mixture of all three of those colors. This species can be identified by its smooth green alternate leaves and its flowers, which have five fused petals, 
and they're fused into the shape of a bell. They also have five stamen with pink or blue anthers and a single pistil. This is a common blue violet, which is a familiar spring ephemeral found in lawns and woodlands. It can be identified by its heart-shaped basil leaves and its flowers, which have five petals with a deep bluish purple color and a white throat that has a dense fuzzy covering. They also have five stamen with yellow anthers and a single pistil. These pretty flowers are commonly used in landscaping, cake decorating, and even as an infusion for honey. This is a downy yellow violet, which is another spring ephemeral with yellow flowers. It can be identified by its deeply lobed leaves with hairy undersides, and its flowers, which have five petals with a yellow color and purple lines, which are pollinator tracks that let the pollinators know where to land. They also have five stamen with yellow anthers and a single pistil. This species is very similar to our common blue violet, but this one just has a yellow flower. This is a meadow buttercup, a bright yellow spring ephemeral found in meadows and along roadsides. It can be identified by its deeply three to five lobed alternate leaves and its flowers, which have five shiny yellow petals, numerous yellow stamen with yellow anthers and a single pistil. This is small flowered crowfoot. It's a tiny spring ephemeral with small yellow flowers. It can be identified by its flowers, which have five small yellow petals. And to me, the center of the flower looks like a small green raspberry. As you can tell, it looks vastly different from the other member of its genus that I just showed you. This is Eastern Columbine, a beautiful species with red and yellow flowers. It can be identified by its alternate lobed compound leaves and its flowers, which have five red and yellow fused petals, five spurs, and a cluster of yellow stamens surrounding the pistil. To me, the flower sort of looks like a crown and it's very distinct and can't be really mistaken for anything else. It's a big favorite for pollinators like hummingbirds and butterflies. This is yellow cordialis, which has yellow flowers and finely divided pinnately compound alternate leaves. Its flowers have a tubular shape, four yellow petals, and a spur-like structure at the base of the flower. It's also very visually similar in appearance to the more common Dutchman's breeches. This is Dutchman's breeches, which is a beautiful white and yellow flower that looks like an upside down pair of pants. It can be identified by its deeply lobed compound alternate leaves and its flowers, which have four white and yellow petals, two spurs, and essential pistil. This is one of my favorite spring ephemeral species just because it's so charismatic and looks like little pairs of pants. This is squirrel corn, and it's very similar in appearance to Dutchman's breeches. However, squirrel corn has flowers that are more elongated with the spurs not extending as far out. Also, squirrel corn doesn't have a very prominent yellow band like Dutchman's breeches does. This is a celandine poppy. This species has opposite leaves that are pinnately lobed with secondary lobes on the primary lobes, making it quite distinctive. The flowers are yellowish orange with four sepals and numerous stamens surrounding a single pistil. If you were to break open the stem of one of these plants, I didn't because I wasn't on private land that I had permission to do so on, but if you were to, you'd see that they have a bright yellow sap that can be used as a dye. This is a bloodroot and it's pretty closely related to the poppy I just showed you. Bloodroot gets its name from the bright red sap that oozes from its roots when they're cut. Its leaves are simple, round, and deeply lobed, while the flower is a single white eight-petaled bloom with yellow stamen and a green center. The flowers are so delicate that if the wind blows just a little too hard, all of the petals are going to fall off. And as you can see, I just barely touched the flower and some of the petals just fell off. This is a may apple, and this plant has umbrella-shaped leaves that produces a singular white flower underneath the leaves. The flower has six to nine petals and numerous stamen in the center. The fruit that follows the flower is edible, but only when fully ripe. Everything else on the plant, including the unripe fruit, is toxic to humans, so don't go eating just miscellaneous parts of this plant. A little hint is that if a may apple plant produces two leaves, it will bear fruit, but if it only produces one leaf, it's not gonna bear fruit that year. This is wild ginger. This plant is easily identified by its heart-shaped leaves that grow in pairs. The flower is unique in that it sits at ground level and has deep maroon flowers with three petals and six stamen. 
this flower actually gives off a little bit of a foul odor, and that's because they're trying to imitate rotting meat so that their pollinators, which are gnats, flies, and beetles, will be interested. This is wild geranium, and its leaves are palmately lobed, and the flower is a five-petaled deep pink bloom with ten stamen that surround a single pistil. This species is super pretty and is commonly used in gardens. This is Jack in the Pulpit, which again is one of my favorites because it has such a unique flower structure that resembles a pitcher plant. Even though this species looks like it's carnivorous, it's not. The flower is surrounded by a hooded leaf that has a single spadix with small inconspicuous flowers on it. This species, just like wild ginger, also gives off a foul odor to attract those flies, gnats, and beetles. This is wild blue phlox. Its leaves are narrow and elongated, while the flower is a five-petaled blue-violet bloom with five stamen and a single pistil. Just like our wild geranium, this species is super common in gardens and even landscaping. However, wild blue phlox is excellent for forming mats. This is cutleaf toothwort, which is easily identified by its toothed leaves that grow in pairs. The flower is four-petaled, white to pink in color, with six stamen and a single pistil. This species is one of the first to bloom in the spring, along with the common violet, spring beauty, and Dutchman's breeches. This is the harbinger of spring. Its leaves are alternate, and it usually has multiple stems per plant. Each leaf is separated into three leaflets that are further separated into three irregularly shaped lobes. Think about the way a parsley leaf looks. They are really similar. The flowers are small and white with five petals, five stamen with reddish brown anthers, and a single white pistil. These tiny flowers appear in small round clusters, and they're the earliest to appear of any of our spring ephemerals, hence the name Harbinger of Spring. When you spot one, you know that the temperatures are rising just enough for plants to grow, and that spring is on its way. These little plants can pop up as early as January. Lastly, this is Solomon's seal. Its leaves are long, alternate, and ovular, while the flower is a small, white to green, bell-shaped flower with six stamen and a single pistil. This species is yet another popular choice for landscaping and gardening. Also, you can see how old the plant is by counting the scars along the rhizome. Although, learning how old the plant is isn't really that important because I don't recommend uprooting these plants. In conclusion, spring ephemerals are a unique and important part of our forest ecosystems, and being able to identify these delicate little wildflowers will help us to better protect them. Now, thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you all in my next video.